Hello, my name is Kim Benjamin, and I'm the founder of the Missouri DWI and Criminal Law Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And today's webinar is going to be about DWIs and what you need to know if you've been charged with a DWI. We're going to start with um, some questions you may have. If you or a loved one has been uh, arrested for a DWI, you may have a lot of questions, and that's what we want to spend some time answering here during this DWI. During our time together, we're going to break it down from start to finish, helping you to understand what it means if you have or if a loved one has been arrested for a DWI, how it affects your life, potentially your job, your driver's license, also how it can affect your family. And because of a DWI arrest in Missouri has implications for both your criminal case and your driver's license case. So we want to break that down so that you understand the differences between the two. First of all, we're going to start with what is a DWI after all? In different states, they call it different things, but it's driving while intoxicated, or you may have heard driving under the influence, DUI, or driving while impaired. Those are all the same thing. They're just different terms for the same thing. Basically, you're being accused of driving while under the influence of alcohol or drugs or medication. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the blood alcohol content. That's the most likely way someone gets a DWI is after drinking alcohol. Um, a DWI can be issued for anyone in Missouri who has been driving over a .08. That is the cutoff across the country in most states, almost every state. Uh, 0.08 blood alcohol content and how they determine your blood alcohol content is either going to be with a breath test or a blood test and sometimes occasionally a urine test but mostly blood and breath tests and typically we want you to know that it you, you can't get a DWI typically or you can't get above a 0.08 typically above um, or if you've drank one drink or even two drinks however you can't have a rule that makes you think, well, if I only drank one drink, I'm safe, or if I drink, you know, three drinks, I'm not safe. And the reason for that is because alcohol affects everybody differently. There are many, many factors that come into play for your blood alcohol content. For example, your gender, your weight, did you eat? Do you have any um, surgeries of your GI system potentially that could affect you? Um, and what kinds of drinks you had? Because one drink, if it's a beer and a 12 ounce beer is very different than one drink if it was a martini with two shots of vodka in it for example so it's the type of drink you've had the content of the alcohol the alcohol level as you know every drink has different percentages of alcohol content so there's lots of different factors so you can't create a rule but it's nice to know that typically one drink uh, is going to get you to a 0.02 if you're doing the average, if you're looking at the average drink of one 12 ounce beer, for example. The thing we want you to know about enhanced or additional pen penalties are that in Missouri, you can have additional penalties if there's an accident, if there's someone that's injured. You can also have additional penalties if you have more than one DWI in your past. And that doesn't mean just a DWI conviction uh, in Missouri, for example. It can be a DWI anywhere in the country. So if you have priors, depending on how many priors you have and when they occurred, you can have an enhanced or additional penalties. For example, a first time offender might have a 90 day suspension of their driver's license if they blew above a 0.08. A first time offender could also have a penalty of one year revocation of their driver's license if they refuse to provide a blood sample or a breath sample upon request of law enforcement. Um, but if it's your second uh, DWI, Oh, let me say this again about the first time DWI, you may be looking uh, at minimal jail time or probation, whereas a second time DWI, you could be looking at further uh, loss of license, you could be looking at additional jail time or probation time. You could also be looking at other enhanced penalties if you were to have a third time DWI, because in Missouri, it's your third that gets you to that felony level, and that's that higher level where people are most likely looking at harsher penalties on the criminal side and depending on if they blew or provided a sample of their blood or breath 
could be looking at additional penalties um, for a longer loss of license if they have prior convictions on their driving record. So it's really hard to predict. You can't say that a third time offender is going to have X result with their driver's license or the criminal side. You can just simply say a third time offender is looking at these different things that could happen to them, such as the felony DWI because it's a third offense and the possible jail time um, becoming a convicted felon because there's no such thing as avoiding a felony conviction with the DWI in Missouri. And if you have two priors that were convictions, you would be looking at potentially a five year or a 10 year denial of your driver's license, as opposed to somebody else in your exact same position on their third offense could be looking at only 90 day suspension, for example, of their driver's license because they didn't have prior convictions on their driving record. So it's really hard to predict what you're looking at based on um, your situation without fully analyzing your entire history as well and analyzing your driving record also. The next thing we want to talk about is the, you know, there's more types of DWIs than just alcohol. Uh, you can have a drug related DWI that's solely related to consumption of drugs and you've had no alcohol that we've had clients who have had marijuana related DWIs. Um, we've had clients who've had methamphetamine related DWIs. We've also had clients who uh, are on medication. And if you're impaired while on medication or any uh, illegal narcotic, then you can find yourself looking at a DUI in those circumstances as well. And so don't think that just because it's a prescribed medication that you're safe, because it, if you're um, impaired by your medication, then you could get a DWI. So you have to be very careful, really talk to your doctor and understand your body, understand how your body reacts to this medication, understand what amount of medication um, is crossing that line that gets you into impairment and really knowing, um, knowing your medication and understanding how you react to it and not combining that medication with other drugs or uh, alcohol is key because usually when people get into trouble it's because they've mixed a medication with alcohol for example but you can uh, have a driving while intoxicated or driving under the influence charge based on medication alone so you should know that Next, we want you to understand that there are sentences that can range from anywhere between probation to a fine to several years in prison. Um, here at our law firm, we take every effort to avoid all of those things. We fight first for a dismissal. Second, we fight for um, a, di a diversion or an amendment of the charge so you're not facing a fine or even having a guilty even having to plead guilty to a DWI at all. That's our first goal for you, but it's not always the outcome. It's not always possible to get that goal. So sometimes you're looking at probation or a fine or a combination of those two things, or you're looking at um, some jail time. Jail time in prison are uh, typically for people who have priors though. First time offenders in, our, uh, in Missouri typically do not uh, have jail time. But remember at the beginning when I mentioned there are enhanced penalties if there's an accident or someone injured, you could be a first time offender and have an injury. If you've injured someone, you could be looking at more serious punishment and that could potentially be jail or prison. So you should know that as well. Fines, just so you know, are a conviction. If you plead guilty to DWI and pay a fine on that DWI, it is absolutely a conviction. It will be on your driving record. Um, it, it is a conviction to the DWI, so you didn't avoid the points of the DWI. You didn't avoid the penalty. It is a conviction to a crime. Um, and while most people don't pay fines on the DWI as first-time offenders, it is possible in certain counties in the state. Um, most people who pay fines on DWIs are paying fines on an amended charge, not the DWI itself, or they're paying fines on companion tickets that they got. Maybe they were speeding while also getting a DWI, so they paid the fine on the, the companion ticket, the, D, the speeding ticket. Um, or maybe you have so many priors that you're now at a level of a felony that you're, you're going to have a conviction anyway. Uh, so you might pay a fine in those situations. Fines typically range anywhere between 500 and uh, 
can be as high as five or ten thousand dollars in Missouri, depending on uh, how many priors you have and what level of felony you're at. A lot of people want to know about jail time. Is it possible that I'm going to go to jail for this DWI? While it's rare for a first time offender to go to jail, it is possible. Like I mentioned before, if there was an accident and someone was injured, those are the people that are most likely looking at some serious jail time. But for your typical first time offender, and occasionally the second time offender, you're not looking at jail time. There are statutes in Missouri for DWI offenders who on a, um, on a second DWI, they can do community service instead of jail time. And there are some judges that will allow that. Same for a third DWI. You can avoid jail time if you do community service in exchange for the jail time, and some judges will allow that. But I want you to understand that some judges, there are some judges who will not allow that, and you will be doing jail time instead of the community service. So the, the more priors you have, the more likely you are looking at jail time instead of community service. And then there are there is a certain point in Missouri when you get to the fourth DWI, for example, that the way you're going to be charged is going to be mandatory jail time by statute. And by a fifth time DWI, you're looking at mandatory uh, two years in prison. So it jumps drastically uh, between the fourth and the fifth DWI in Missouri. What adds to jail time? People often ask, well, what, besides what I've already told you, what could cause me to have to do jail time? And I've told you, if there's an accident and someone's injured, um, if you have a really high uh, breath test or blood test and your lawyer doesn't know how to keep those things out of evidence, then chances of you doing jail time increase because our statute in Missouri does have um, a level where they're going to treat you differently. If your blood or breath test is above a 0.15, you are going to be treated differently than the person who had a blood or breath test at 0.09, for example. Um, another, in addition to injury or a high uh, blood test result or breath test result, uh, someone who is most likely to get jail time is someone with a lot of priors like we've talked about. By the time you get to your third DWI offense in your life, that's when you're more likely looking at jail time. But I'll tell you, there are people who avoid jail time altogether on their third, and that is something you have to talk to your lawyer about. How do I avoid jail time is a very important question. And one example of how we've been able to help our clients avoid jail time, even when they have priors, is that the client sees this as a wake-up call. It's your third or your fourth DWI, and because of the third or fourth arrest in your life, you've decided, I cannot drink anymore. Clearly, I have a problem. I'm going to go to treatment. I am going to uh, address this issue. And so by the time we resolve your case, you have several months, if not a year, of treatment under your belt, whether it be AA in combination with inpatient and outpatient therapies. Um, but nonetheless, you have treated this seriously and you've proven to the court that you're no longer a threat to society. Uh, in addition, you most likely were on some sort of alcohol, alcohol monitoring device so that the judge sees that sees evidence, not just your word, but evidence that you were not drinking for a lengthy period of time. So those are some, some things that we work with our clients on on how to avoid jail time, in addition to educating you on what adds to your jail time. We talked a little bit about driver's license suspensions. And in Missouri, whenever you get arrested for a DWI, um, you are looking at either a 90-day suspension or a one-year revocation just solely based on whether you refused or provided a sample that showed above a 0.08 alcohol result. So in those circumstances, you are looking at a driver's license suspension or revocation. And what we do in our firm is that we go to trial on those cases and try to save you from that loss of license. And we've been very successful in doing that. So it is possible to prevent you from losing your driver's license. We've had many people say, well, I blew above a 0.08. I know I drank too much. So what's the point in fighting? But I have to tell you, there are many clients that we've been, been able to help save their driver's license, even when they come to us with, I'm guilty, I'm going to lose my license, what's the point? We've been able to teach them and show them that we can actually save their driver's license. So it's not the end of the world. Um, in addition, 
uh, if you do lose your driver's license, we will educate you through the process of being able to actually drive during a suspension or a revocation. Missouri does have a hardship license opportunity for you. Um, there are several things you have to do, including one of them, which is an install and uh, an um, ignition interlock device on your vehicle, but and that's a breathalyzer on your on your car. Um, but nonetheless, it gives you the opportunity to drive for work, school, uh, children, uh, doctors, different things. So it, it gives you the chance to drive and at least keep your job. And that is the next slide: the hardship license. Um, people who qualify for the hardship license, it's, it's not everybody, but a lot of people do qualify for it and they can drive the entire time that they're suspended or revoked under a hardship license. So we will guide you through that process. Some of you, it's a simple form that you file at the Department of Revenue and you, um, you have to do certain things like have a certain kind of car insurance called SR22. You have to um, have the ignition lock device on your car, and if you drive for work, not just drive to and from work in your personal car, but drive a vehicle for work, you can also um, a, could potentially apply for and obtain a waiver so that you don't have to have the ignition lock device on that vehicle, but you would have to have it on your personal vehicle. So there are lots of people that will qualify for a hardship license, and we would help you through that process. If you're arrested for a DWI, what could happen to your car? By the time you're watching this uh, video, if you've been already been arrested for a DWI, you know nine times out of 10, your car has been towed, but not every time. Uh, sometimes the police officer will let you call a friend or a family member to come and get your car. Uh, that happens sometimes. It's not in every jurisdiction. It's not uh, every police officer, but it's the policy of some agencies and it is the norm in certain locations in Missouri, but not every location. So be prepared for that worst case scenario of your car gets towed and you have that additional expense of having to get your car out of the tow lot and pay them quite a bit of money to get your car back. What could happen to your car insurance? If you have a DWI that does end up on your driving record, and that's if, because sometimes we can prevent your DWI and the fact that you blew above a 0.08 or refused the blood or breath test, sometimes we can keep those completely off your driving record. If we do, then this does not apply to you. But if we don't, and it's on your driving record that one of these things happened to you, then what happens is you're going to be required to carry the SR22 car insurance, which is an expensive car insurance, um, but you're required to carry that for a minimum of two, two years from the date your suspension starts. So not until your suspension starts are you required to get it. Um, you have to have it throughout the entire hardship time, but in addition, it's two years from the date the suspension or revocation started. And it's required for those two years um, on all the vehicles you might be seen driving. DWI charges and uh, your job. Well, it can be challenging for many of you. Most likely, uh, the people who have the most difficulty are those who their employer requires them to have a special license, like a CDL driver. If you're required to have more than just your personal driver's license to get to and from work, you're at high risk of losing that job or at least losing the specific job that you've been assigned that requires you to work for your employer. We can try to save your driver's license and prevent all of that from happening to you, but um, if you have anything show up on your driving record, including a guilty plea to a DWI, even if we avoided the conviction, that guilty plea is going to cause you to lose your CDL for one year. So it's very serious for those of you with a CDL. Uh, for those of you who just don't want your employer to know, um, the employer typically doesn't, first of all, you don't have to tell your employer unless your job requires it. You don't have to tell your employer um, unless you're also like driving under their insurance. For if, you, if you're running errands for your employer and they have an insurance company that is guaranteeing that if you're driving for work that you're covered under the business, then those are the types of people who do have to tell their employers. But otherwise, you typically don't have to tell your employer, but your employer could find out about it if it's on CaseNet and they happen to search your name and learn about it that way. 
Um, but for the most part, people are able to protect their jobs and save their jobs. It's just special types of jobs that are really in high risk and, and jeopardy of uh, losing their jobs. And like a school bus driver, a delivery driver, uh, anyone with a CDL or special licenses to drive uh, certain people like children or the elderly, those are gonna be the ones at high risk. Civil lawsuits. Additional civil lawsuits typically don't happen under the, the average scenario for a DWI. However, if you've caused any sort of property damage or uh, personal injury to someone, if you've injured someone or, or death of another person, certainly you are looking at civil lawsuits. And those are completely different than what we do when we're handling your DWI. As criminal defense lawyers, we are not civil lawyers who defend you or fight for you in that civil lawsuit. Typically, your, law, uh, your insurance company would hire you an attorney, and this person would specialize in insurance defense. So that person would be separate from us. We may talk to them, we may work with them, but you could have a civil lawsuit, an additional lawyer through your insurance company to help defend a civil lawsuit if one was uh, filed uh, against you. Now you should know that your age does matter. Everyone above the age of 21, obviously in, in the United States is legal to drink alcohol and they are treated differently under our DWI laws in Missouri. Because if you're under 21 and caught drinking, you can get a DWI at a .08. That still is true for you. However, there's this other window between .02 and .08 that you can still get in trouble. You might not have a DWI for being char you know, the criminal charge of driving while intoxicated, but you could certainly have a charge that's called zero tolerance, and it can affect your driver's license. So just like those people that are 21 and above and blew above a 0.08 on a breathalyzer and they're going to lose their license for 90 days, you too, under the age of 21, could have um, a zero tolerance charge that takes your driver's license and suspends it for 90 days. And then to get it back, you have to take a certain class called SATOP, Substance Abuse Traffic Offender Program. Typically, uh, the fees total around $500, $550 for that program. Uh, and you also have to, um, ha in addition to that suspended license, you could qualify for a hardship license, uh, but you're going to um, have to jump through the hoops to get reinstated, just like those above 21 who blew above a 0.08. Whereas if they blew a 0.04, for example, above the age of 21, they're not going to be affected like you would be. We get asked a lot what to do if you get pulled over and you know you've been drinking and you just don't know what to do. The officer is going to start the entire encounter as he would even if you were just speeding and he didn't smell alcohol or suspect any sort of impairment or intoxication. He's going to ask you for your driver's license, your proof of insurance. He's going to ask you for uh, where you're coming from or where you're going to. They're, it's very common in their training to try to gain rapport with you by asking you those questions, but also to have their eyes, their ears, and their nose open to looking for reasons that this is beyond the reason for the stop. This is more than just a speeding ticket, for example. This could be an impairment issue. So. When you uh, answer questions, if you choose to answer questions, which you don't have to, you do have to provide your driver's license and your insurance, but you don't have to talk. Um, if you do provide information, uh, they're listening and they're smelling. You've rolled down the window at this point, whether it was a little bit of a crack or all the way down, um, they are asking, they are uh, noticing the odor of alcohol. And that could ask them, that could cause them to ask you, why, why do I smell alcohol? Or have you been drinking? And a lot of people start saying, oh yeah, I just came from such and such a place and I had a couple of drinks. A lot of people just naturally react and tell either the truth or what they want to tell in that moment. Um, I often tell people it's better to not say anything at all than to say anything. So what you might do in that situation is consider saying, sir, you have my license and my um, insurance, please just finish what you're doing. and." let me go or why do you or ask why do you want to know those things or simply say i'm not going to answer your questions 
or you also have the option of just saying nothing at all and just waiting. You have to recognize that no matter what option you choose, even though you have the right not to speak, it sets off red flags for the officer and now they're curious what's going on. Why are you not talking? Why are you um, being silent? Why are you um, not answering their questions? Or if you are answering their questions, to be listening for slurred speech or the odor of alcohol. So some people can, and if you say this, then it can stop the um, entire questioning. And that is, I know I have the right to remain silent and I'm going to exercise that right. Something to the effect of pleading the Fifth Amendment or not speaking because of your Miranda rights and you know you have the right to remain silent. Something to that effect. Um, should cause an officer to no longer ask you questions. However, that doesn't mean it stops the officer from, from investigating you if he or she believes that there's something else happening, such as an impaired driving situation. So they could ask you out of the car, they could command you out of the car, they could uh, continue to do their DWI investigation. And you can refuse everything along the way but you do put yourself at risk for an escalated situation, especially if they're commanding you out of the car. If it's a command, you don't have a choice. You could ask, do I have a choice? And if they say no, then you do what the officer says because you're not supposed to disobey the officer, but you certainly don't have to speak or do anything they've asked you to do, including the field sobriety tests. And that takes us to our next slide. What to do if you're asked to take a breathalyzer or a field sobriety test? You can certainly say no to all the field sobriety tests. And I have to tell you that I've had clients do that. And it, while it gives the officer and the prosecutor less evidence against you, it also gives us as your defense attorney less opportunity to fight that your DWI was a valid arrest. So it's really a catch 22. Uh, people who refuse to do the field sobriety tests put themselves in a position of the police officer saying, well, this is all the evidence I had. They refused to give me, uh, do, they refused to do the field sobriety tests when I asked. And now that refusal to do those tests can be used against you. And the person who's deciding whether you're guilty or not can de decide that the reason you refused to go do those tests was because you were intoxicated. So it's a catch 22, it puts yourself in. Or you can agree to do all those tests, but make sure that if you have any sort of disability, any sort of pain, any sort of um, dizziness issues, uh, blood sugar issues, anything that could affect your balance, anything that could affect uh, your ability to do these tests, including bad shoes or you're freezing, it's 20 degrees out here and you don't have a coat, anything that could prevent you from doing these tests well, you need to say something at this point. Um, when it comes to the breathalyzer test, there are typically two of them. Typically, not always, but typically you have a, a preliminary breath test at the scene, and then after an arrest, you're taken to the station and you perform the actual breathalyzer test that's going to be used against you. Sometimes that is done at the scene because some agencies have the valid, the, the test that they're allowed to have in Missouri to do a test of you, of your breath right there at the scene, but typically you're taken to the station. Regardless on both of those, the, the preliminary breath test, the one that they put in your mouth when you're standing outside the vehicle, that one can't cause you a loss of license, but the other one can. The one that you do either inside a vehicle or inside a building, that one can take your driver's license and they're required to tell you that prior to you providing the breath sample. And I've had clients call me in the middle of the night and ask whether to blow or not. So I can't tell you that there's an easy answer to yes or no, because I've had to ask them about 20 questions before I say, okay, I want you to blow or I don't want you to blow. Um, typically when someone blows, or someone provides a blood sample, we're able to fight the, the admissibility of those results. When someone refuses, there is still a fight for us to have for you, but it's a different fight and it's less of a fight because the implication is the reason you refused is that you were intoxicated. So if you're going to refuse, uh, it kind of ties our hands behind our back a little bit, but not completely. Uh, so just know there's no easy answer. It's a very difficult decision to make, but I typically tell people, 
Um, after asking about 20 questions, in that particular situation, I think you should blow or I think you should refuse. So that's why I can't tell you that there's an easy answer now. Implied consent. Remember I told you that they're going to tell you in advance of the official breath test that can take your driver's license. They have to tell you that it's going to take your driver's license. That's what's known as implied consent in Missouri. They have to read it to you and it tells you um, that if you provide a sample above a 0.08 uh, that you will lose your driver's license or if you refuse to provide a sample, you will lose your driver's license. And they tell you immediately, but that's not true. They tell you you'll immediately lose your driver's license, but you actually get a piece of paper allowing you to drive for 15 more days. And then if you hire an attorney, we can postpone it a lot, a lot longer than that, in fact. So, but that's what the implied consent is. When you took your driver's test back when you were 16 years old, you actually essentially signed a contract with the state of Missouri, for lack of a better word, um, where you've implied that you will consent to your blood or breath or urine if you're being accused of driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. That's why it's implied consent, because everyone agrees to do this as a society to drive on the public roads in Missouri. You still need to cooperate though. Remember we talked a little bit about your Miranda rights and your Fifth Amendment right and how you can say, you know, you can choose to remain silent. But I told you if you're commanded to do something or if you ask, am I required to do this? Or are you asking me to do it? Um, because you are required to do what you're told to do and commanded to do, but everything else you don't have to do. You can simply choose not to do. Besides giving your driver's license and your insurance, that's really the most that you're required to do. Otherwise, once they say get out of your car versus would you please get out of your car, you can see the difference there. One is a command and you're required to, the other is a request. So feel free to ask if you're being required to do something because almost everything else is thoroughly your cooperation and you do not have to cooperate. You just have to follow commands. And ultimately, we don't want you to panic because when you're pulled over, we, people are going to be nervous, anxious, whether they've been drinking or not. So certainly don't panic. Remain calm and listen to the police officer and make sure you understand that everything you've learned so far, that you're complying with commands, you're listening to questions, answering them carefully, but there's no need to panic under the situation. It's easier said than done, I know, but do your best to remain calm. It's scary to be, pull, be pulled over and questioned by the police whether you've been drinking or not. So just try to remain calm and get to an attorney as soon as possible. Because as early as you want in your conversation with law enforcement, you can say you'd like to talk to a lawyer and, um, and take advantage of that opportunity at the first available opportunity. They don't have to let you call one right there immediately upon pulling you over, but they do ultimately have to give you an opportunity. For resources and further reading, I, I know you're all familiar with Google and uh, ChatGPT is now very popular, but you, um, you can look up the laws in your state. You can look up on our website. We have a lot of blogs, a lot of reading uh, materials on our website at www.dwicriminallawcenter.com. Uh, Missouri Department of Revenue has a fabulous website to answer your questions. They have a very robust FAQ section for the Missouri Department of Revenue and your driver's license issues and their alcohol detection uh, program. So feel free to uh, search for everything you want on the internet, but nothing is better than talking to a DWI specialist, a lawyer who specializes in DWIs and most of their practice is DWI defense. And in summary, we want you to remember to remain calm and courteous, remain silent as much as you can, refuse the sobriety test if you so choose, but know there are consequences for that action and to absolutely contact an attorney as soon as you have the chance. And to keep this conversation going, feel free to give us a call. Whether it's you or a loved one, feel free to give us a call. We will help you out if you call 
816-441-4614. That's 816-441-4614. Thank you so much.